Good morning, everyone. This is Arbitrary Habitats. My name is Fred. I have the great fortune to present an interview with one of the pioneers of the underground comics movement, Robert Williams. Williams is most noted for his involvement with Zap Comics, which began in 1967 by Robert Crumb. The timeliness of this interview cannot be overstated because on Friday, June 3rd, there will be a gala opening celebration for the exhibition of the original art from Zap Number 13, which is dedicated to fellow Zap artist Rick Griffin, who died in a motorcycle accident in 1991. Robert Williams, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on your show, and uh, thanks for that uh, flower introduction there. There we go. <laughs> we don't have to be so formal. We can kind of kick back. And since it's a midnight to three show, we can pepper it with whatever language we like. Okay. If required. But anyway. <laughs> so back to uh, my original question was... Uh, how was your involvement in Zap 13? How did that come up? Well, I've been in all the issues since Zap 4, and uh, I was just one of the one of the seven artists that uh, was in the the Zap stable there. So. And uh, in Zap 4, that was the constellation of the of Dorma Senatoria. That's it. Yeah, the, which was the Big Bang Theory. That's right. Yeah, that's that's one of the uh, one of the most memorable strips that of the Zap comics that uh, me and my friends always bang around, as far as the tale from the old man in the boat. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite humorous. Well, now, uh, I guess I just was there to be in thirteen. See, so there's not much I can tell you about. Uh, my participation in 13, other than uh, it was pre I did, I did uh, three pages, a single page in um, uh, a center spread, and uh, I participated in uh, two of the jams. Hmm. Okay. And uh, Zap 12, let me see here. What, what work did you do in Zap 12, if you could elaborate on that? Like I did uh, 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 The Bone Man? Yeah, a 10-page story and a two-page story. And it was on the Boned Man. Right. Yeah, your work is uh, uh, most noted for uh, your bizarre characters like uh, Coochie Cootie and the Boned Man. And yeah. there's even a, a broccoli with a grenade heart. That's right. Where do you come up with these ideas as far as... Everyone always asks me, how do I come up with these ideas? They, they just come. I have to sit down and come up with these ideas or I have to go out and get a job. <laughs> so I sit down and come up with these ideas. Right. Uh, now you do. Um, I live in Orange, California, and uh, there is a gallery. Yeah, there's a there's a gallery just around the corner from me by the uh, what they call the Circle. Uh, that uh, I think a few months ago had a, a showing of your work. Is it Breeden Gallery. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Nice people. I did very well there. Oh, great! You had an opening, and you were even there, right? Yeah, I was there. They uh, they had a print show. What was it about six or eight months ago? Was it that long? Yeah. Yeah. I remember driving by and seeing a huge crowd up. Going, oh, yeah, I, I was wondering what kind of people am I going to attract down there at that little gallery, and I got out of the car, and there's a big crowd there. <laughs> I was just astounded. So I was real proud of that. Yeah, that's great. So do you do uh, gallery openings often in Southern California? Well, it, it takes me a while to build up a body of work, you know, so it's, they're, they're not that often. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, most of your work is pretty involved. Do you work mostly with oils or acrylics? Yeah, I work with oil paint. I'm yeah. a painter. I'm primarily a painter, but uh, I'm basically a cartoonist. Right. Your ink work is uh, is very elaborate and very in-depth. Well, thank you. Yes, and I was wondering what uh, what influences that uh, you can say that you draw on from a comic point of view well, or a traditional sense? I, uh, I was one of these kids that uh, was raised right after the Second World War, and uh, got a hold of what was called EC Comic Books. Mm. And that was a, a family of comic books uh, that were probably the best comic books ever made. They had Wallace Woods and Harvey Kurtzman and Will Elder and Jack Davis and people like that. And they were probably the best written comic books. They were actually adult comic books that kids got a hold of. And the, uh, later they were ran out of business in the early 50s. Keith Offer Subcommittee uh, had a big crackdown on uh, comic books uh, in response to a book called um, 
seduction of the innocents by a guy named Dr. Wortham. This is a whole Senate investigation to crack down on these comics that they thought were creating criminals in our society. And that's where the Comics Code Authority came in? That's right. And, right. I, and I guess they probably were right back then because it sure messed me and a lot of other artists up, you know. Uh, to our, to uh, Zap Reader's benefit. Right. Zap is nothing but an extension of those comic books, you know. It's just a violent and vulgar reaction to... The suppression of good comic books back in the early 50s. And even, uh, it's funny how it's gone full circle, uh, specific, specifically with Zap number four, yeah. with the legal, uh, the, the legal entanglement with that issue. Yeah. Right, so um, could you describe that? Uh, once that issue came out, uh, Victor Moscoso mentioned that it was primarily a, a reseller that was uh, involved in that. Well, there was a lot of resell. A lot of dealers got busted for that, a tremendous amount. If, the thing is, you have to, you know, if you see Zap now, it's not that big of a deal. But if you looked at Zap Comics in 1967, 68, 69, 70, it, it, was, a, it, was, it was a revolution. There had never been anything like it. Like, Mad Comics kind of was there. You know, it was kind of. But Zap was just... It pulled out all the stops. It was any program, anything you could think of. And it wasn't inhibited by political correctness like things are now. You know, you could have done anything in those comics. So when, when those comics started hitting the stands, and this is, this is when a lot of your youth was primarily very psychedelic, you know, and, and exploring new thought patterns and stuff. When this stuff hit, it was like mental hand grenades. So when it, it immediately just took four giant steps beyond any point of graphic laws or legislation. It just threw those on the floor. So when these things started started getting into um, conservative hands, there was starting to become a reaction in uh, the late 60s, a legal reaction. Would that stem from the, uh, the six, I guess it would stem from the success that Zap had too, as far as uh, the numbers that were out there? That's right. There, there was millions of Zap comics sold. So in New York, I had heard that there was something like 75 busts of dealers in New York and a large number in San Francisco and a large number in Los Angeles. I, I keep hearing different figures, so I'm not sure of that. But there was an awful lot of people, that were, uh, news dealers, that were arrested. And test case went on, and it, uh, it, it got to federal court. And um, that, that Zap 4, I think the... Crumb's story, Joe Blow was one of the bones of contention in there, but the one that really, they really had their claws on was a story in there Spain did. They said there was absolutely no social redeeming value to it. But then that, uh, that got overturned or something happened to it. But l let me tell you of another story a few years later in the 70s that, uh, that happened to, uh, we, we, we not only put out Zap, but we put out a few little small comic books called um, uh, Jizz and... And Felch, which is one of my favorites. And, uh, what was the other? Uh, Snatch. Snatch. Well, you're, you're versed on this thing, aren't you? Well, let's say that uh, I tried to prepare by reading Jay Kennedy's comics guide, uh, the buyer's guide prior to this. But, but, you know, I've collected for a number of years. We did those little small ones, uh, Snatch and Jizz, and there was one called Cunt. And we just, you know, the first couple of them, we didn't sign our names. But, you know, they seemed to sell well, and they seemed to get to a lot of people, so we started boldly start signing them, you know. And there was really not a lot of trouble with those little comics. And they were as vulgar as you could possibly make something, see. I mean, we were just seeing, seeing just how ridiculously silly and vulgar we could be. <laughs> so time went by, and uh, I was talking to S. Clay Wilson one time, and he said he was talking to Ken Weaver of the Bugs, and he'd come up with a term. He'd heard a term. It was an old term called felch. And the term uh, meant um, re retrieving the semen out of someone's anal canal after they'd been sodomized. So I thought, my God, that's the filthiest thing I've ever heard. That's, that'd be the name of our next comic. <laughs> there you go. Or comic. Yeah. So I inherited the editorship right there on the spot of putting that together. And you graced the cover. 
and I grace the cover. Well, see, if you get the cover going, then you got a comic, and you can just have anyone fill it. Right. So the trick's to always get a cover. <laughs> so I got the cover done, and then <clears throat> boy, everybody wanted to participate in that thing because of that theme. So time went by, and a couple of years went by on it. No trouble. And they were selling. And they were selling. And then here on the West Coast, now there's a fellow named George DiCaprio. Now, George DiCaprio's uh, son is Leonardo DiCaprio, the famous young actor now. But George um, George was the underground comic book distributor for Southern California. Hmm. And he, uh, he would go around and take care of all these psychedelic shops and record stores, one thing or another, supply them in underground comics. And he had a store down in Long Beach that got busted. And so all the rest of the record stores and, and psychedelic shops and stuff, they wouldn't buy any more comics. They wanted to see what the test case was going to be like on this comic, see, on this, this bus. So what had happened was the police went down there in Long Beach, and they grabbed all the underground comics, and they took them back to the police station. And I guess they were just going through there, and they said, well, we've surely got a case of this felch, you know. This won't, this won't get a conviction. Nothing will. <laughs> so uh, anyway, George went down with the lawyer and the owner of the uh, psychedelic shop and uh, the guy, that, uh, the clerk that was working at the time that got arrested. He went down there and they had a hearing and they were sitting down outside the judge's uh, office there and the prosecuting attorney and the judge was in, in the judge's office there in his room. And, they had a big box of comics, and apparently what had happened was this dirty box of comics was sitting around the Long Beach Police Department. Somebody was thumbing through there and found that felt. She thought, well, we won't miss a little one. Pulled it. So. Oh, you're kidding. So uh, George and these people were sitting out in, the, out in the waiting room outside the judge's office, and all I could hear is a judge yelling to the prosecuting prosecute attorney, well, where's the felt? Where's the felt? <laughs> And, and they couldn't find the felt, so they dropped the case. So George's business picked back up again and everything because of this case. See, because it was dropped. Hmm. Well, the, those uh, those words coming from the judge's chambers could be misconstrued, too. Yeah, from the judge. You know, <laughs> Where's my felt? Oh, boy. So were any of the other issues, uh, any of the uh, uh, snatches or jizzes later on, I, were they? I would imagine that there was, as big as this country is, I'm sure there was other situations that happened, you know, dealing in those comics by somebody. Right. They're still being printed now, though. Uh, Aren't they? Or no, there, there was talk about... See, all those little dirty comics were put into a, a one big compendium called a Snatch Sampler. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking about reprinting the Snatch Sampler. So pretty soon you'll be able to get that whole pile of garbage again. <laughs> <laughs> that proud pile of garbage. It still holds up. It's pretty filthy material, let me tell you. <laughs> now, there's a, I was reading through the uh, uh, Jay Kennedy's guide and uh, looking up all the all the works that you have done. Uh, there was a book called Yama Yama Ugly Head. Yeah. What is that? Uh, that was done with S. Clay Wilson? Yeah. Now, you're familiar with Gary Panner. Right. He did some Zappa covers and... Well, that wasn't his fame. He, he, Gary Panner was the probably the father of punk rock art. And he started out in the early 80s as a cartoonist for a, a punk rock publication called Slash in Los Angeles. See, mm -hmm. This is a famous punk rock tabloid. And almost overnight, in a couple of issues, he reached nationwide prominence among the punk rockers in this real slash and burn art style. It's come to be known as punk rock art. Mm -hmm. So he put out a he put out this little Xerox shitty little thing called the Asshole. Did you ever see a copy of that? No, I never did. It's a, it's a little Xerox punk rock comic called the Asshole. Now here's me and S. Clay Wilson and all these first generation underground artists. You know we're becoming old farts and not getting anywhere. And here's this Gary Panner just comes and steals all this underground thunder from this new generation. See. So I, I got Wilson a copy of the asshole, you know, and he says, hey, well, let's do a shitty thing like this ourselves, you know. <laughs> uh, we can do crap like this, you know, on a turn of the wrist. So now I'm, I'm not being derogatory to, to Gary, you know, but, uh, you know, the stuff was pretty breezy. So he says, yeah, sure. So I did a character called Yama Yama. And Yama Yama was a, a turn-of-the-century Victorian um nursery rhyme song about this boogeyman, say, called the Yama Yama Man. 
So I picked the Yama Yama man to do this real crude stick figure character. And uh, S. Clay Wilson chose the ugly head, say, this real ugly geometric punk rock looking character. So what we did was we did a 69 issue. In other words, you go halfway through the comic and you have to turn it over and start from the other way because it's upside down backwards, the other half of the comic. So you've got actually two front covers. Similar to Zap 3? Right. Yeah. So not only do we do this real shitty, scratchy drawing, but on top of it, we had the printer put red kidney shapes and checkerboards all through the thing, so it was almost unreadable. <laughs> it was a nightmare, a punk rock nightmare. And... Uh, it was just a, a tremendous success, you know. It, uh, it got us what we want. It got us our laurels, our punk rock laurels. And there you go. If you're just tuning in, this is Arbitrary Habitats. My name's Fred. I'm interviewing uh, Zap Comics artist Robert Williams. Uh, you've been in the Southern California area for most of your career. Is that correct? Right. right. Um, I noticed in uh, Jay Kennedy's book again uh, that you were born in New Mexico. Um, I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay, and did you, where was your first uh, artistic exposure? Was that uh, over there or out here? Or? Well, uh, when I was young, I used to paint signs for grocery store windows and stuff, you know, and then I got a little older, I started doing hot rod art, painting monsters on the side of hot rods and stuff like that, so I was always some kind of wrist manipulating artist, you know, so. Well, that's, uh, you mentioned the hot rods. Now, Big Daddy Ross was uh, um, big in the hot rod art, wasn't he? Yeah, I was his art director from 1965 to 1970. Oh, okay. So I was right there in the middle of the hot rod, uh, rat fink period of graphic history. All right. Now, wasn't the, uh, the the gallery opening that was here in Orange, was that a combo with you and uh, Big Daddy Ross? No. No, it was just yourself. No, now, what had happened down there in Orange County was I was in the Laguna Beach show, Custom Culture. I don't know if you saw that or not. No, I didn't. Well, you missed one hell of a show, because that was a giant museum show that uh, is now traveling the country. It went to Baltimore and is now in Seattle, and then it's going to uh, uh, Australia and Japan. But it was me and Ed Big Daddy Roth and Von Dutch, and it was called Custom Culture. And it had a whole lot of other artists that were hot rod influenced. So it, had, uh, it, it was a very impressive show. Custom meaning custom cars? Yeah, custom cars and the art that uh, grew up in America that was an offshoot of hot rod art. Hmm. Okay, do you go to a lot of uh, meets, hot rod meets well, and things? Rod You're a hot rodder. Yeah. Where do you, uh, do you race around here locally? Well, I go to different hot rod meets. You know, there's uh, always something going on. There's even a, a radio show on KPFK, I believe, on Sundays that... Uh, talks about uh, motorcycle racing and car racing. Are you familiar with that show? Yeah, it's quite a good show. It's usually uh, either late morning or early afternoon. And I'm not much of a hot rider, but it sure is fun to listen to. Yeah, so what was your first published work that you can remember? Well, let's see. God, that goes back into the early 60s, maybe the 50s. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, I went to Los Angeles City College in the early 60s, and I was the cartoonist for the collegian and school newspaper. But I think I had stuff uh, in ads and illustrations that went back into the 50s. Mm -hmm. But that was out here in Southern California? No, that was in New Mexico. Oh, it was? Oh. I'd always done some kind of illustration work or something. Hmm. Did you study art in college? Yes. Okay, what... Uh, I went to Los Angeles City College, and I went to Schnard's Art Institute for a little while. Huh, did you have, um, like, a... I mean, your, your work has a pretty uh, realistic touch to it, almost classic. Well, you know, that's because I'm influenced by comic books and Salvador Dali and, you know, naked ladies and posters and, you know, things that are fun to look at. Yeah, sure. Did, because uh, Rick Griffin lived down in, uh, I believe he lived in Laguna Beach. Yeah, he lived in Laguna. No, not Laguna. No, it wasn't? Uh, where in the hell is it? Uh, San Clemente. He lived in San Clemente. Oh, in San Clemente. Uh, did your close proximity, you know, allow you guys to work together oh, yeah. aside? Me and him are the only Southern California Zap artists. Mm -hmm. Did you do a work, uh, work together? Oh, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, in Surfer Magazine, uh, Tales from the Tube, you both worked on. That's right. Yeah. That's right. How did that come about, other than Rick being a surfer? Yeah. 
he was friends with him over at Surfer Magazine and talked him into doing a comic book. And he said he'd get Zap friend, and he got us all in on it. Yeah, and what was your strip in that one? Um, uh, Leonoid the Aquanoid. <laughs> It was, about a, it was about a jug of water, of uh, prime, primeval plasma. Oh, that's right. You know, and, uh, it was a little surfing jug of uh, prehistoric fluid, you know, that uh, would face any danger. <laughs> and get the babes. Yeah, get the, well, you, to be a good surfer, you have to get the babes. You have you to know? get the babes, that's right. So what are you going to have on display at the show, which I must add is uh, June 3rd at uh, La Luz de Jesus Gallery? Um, You're gonna have uh, what? I'll have my zaps, my, my zap stuff. It's in thirteen, and I'll have some earlier stuff from the earlier zaps. And who's in zap thirteen of yours? Is this Coochie well, Coochie Cootie? Yeah, the, the the few pages that I've done for zap thirteen are going to be there, and if, uh, the, I think there'll be a smattering of my other zap stuff. A few of the covers that I've done in the past will be on display, plus uh, some other assorted prints and graphics and stuff. You know. For, for, for viewing and for sale. Mm, great. Would you have any uh, current works in progress? Well, I'm painting for a show right now that'll be at the beginning of next year at the Tamra Bain Gallery. And where is that? The Tamra Bain Gallery is on uh, Melrose, just east of, just west of uh, Fairfax. Okay. In fact, this coming Saturday, I've got a, a print show opening there. I'm premiering a, a set of uh, prints and... Uh, a portfolio of uh, graphics. And that occurs this Saturday? What's that's, the date for that? That's, uh, that'll be the 28th, Saturday the 28th, from uh, 12 o'clock to uh, 5 o'clock at Tamar Bain. Oh, okay. Melrose. Do you have the address for that? Cause it, well, I, yeah, I can... Because I'd like to get my listeners aware of that, and I may even show up and... I'm fast going through my Rolodex here. Yeah, uh, t Tamara Bain is my uh, Los Angeles gallery, and my New York gallery is Bess Cutler. Uh, let's see, here it is. Uh, the address for Tamara Bain is uh, 8025 Melrose Avenue, Los Angeles, right on Melrose, just, just west of uh, Fairfax. Okay, not far from where uh, the La Luz gallery is. That's right. Yes. That's right. Uh, okay, great. Tamara Bain Gallery shows a lot of underground stuff or near underground stuff, uh, pornographic shows and erotic shows and things like that. And it uh, it specializes in uh, art with a certain amount of dexterity and engineering in it. Mm -hmm. Which is definitely uh, evident in your work. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's uh, Robert Williams' show at Tamara Bain right. this Saturday, the 28th of May, that's and that's 8025 Melrose, Los Angeles, California, from 12 to 5. That's right. Okay. And then, we, then we got the Zap show the next week on Friday, June the fifth. No, June the third. June third and fourth for the signing. Are you going to be there for that? Signing. I'll be there for the signing. Okay. And the next day there'll be a, a book signing and comic signing, or whatever. And, um, what happens there is everyone that's got a Zap comic brings it in to get it signed. You know. Mm -hmm. So that'll that'll be an interesting thing. So if uh, if. Uh, a vigorous uh, collector comes in with a Felch comic for a certain price. Would you sign it? If they're over age, they're of course. Yeah. Over eighteen. <laughs> over eighteen. Well, this is a great event. Uh, the last event was uh, for Zap 12 in 1989 in New York. That's right, and that was just a giant success. And that was that was a monstrous big event. People lined up five blocks to get into that thing. Do you think the turnout's going to be any different out here? Well. I hope it isn't going to be that big, but, you know, there'll be a lot of people. It'll be fun. It'll yeah. Be a lot of fun. And, of course, we have a lot more room here at La Luz de Jesus than we did at the Psychedelic Solution in New York. So it'll be a much more comfortable situation. All right. Uh, I'm I'm definitely going to be there. It starts at 8 o'clock on the, the 3rd, Friday night. Right. Uh, unfortunately, I have to do my show at midnight, but I'll still promo it that night, too, uh, for the uh, signing the next day, which starts at 3 o'clock. Okay. That's right. And I, you know, I, I am a, a painter, and I, I, most of my shows are primarily painting. But I'll tell you, it's it, it's actually pretty much comic book painting. It's it's cartoon related, and I've kind of uh, wedged my way, my foot in the door into the real art world, 
mean, it's, it's been really a, a big hassle to get into the art world when you're using cartoon imagery. And uh, I'll tell you... Uh, Do they poo-poo it? Well, yeah. Yeah, I've had some very successful shows. I have, uh, my last four shows have been sold out. And uh, the, the last show I had at um, Best Cutler in New York, I uh, sold 30 oil paintings. They were sold before the doors opened. and had a giant crowd and a police barricade outside. <laughs> and this was right in the middle of Soho, where I, was, I wasn't very appreciated, see. So comics and comic graphics and cartoons are starting to win their way in, you know. So I would, well, what I'm building up to is to, to get the support of people that are interested in cartoon imagery, to support it any way they can, whether it's comic books, whether it's animated cartoons, or whether it's cartoon paintings like I do. You know? Right. Uh, my, my, my little cheap prophecy for the future is, and... In 50 or 100 years from now, when they look back to this century, they're going to say the music of the 20th century was rock and roll and the art was cartoons. Say, hmm. I think that would be the observation of the future, looking back at the graphics in this period of time. Yeah, it would be interesting. Uh, do you uh, cross over? You mentioned animations. Do you cross over into animation at all? I've got storyboards in one thing or another. I was just involved in a, a butthole surfer uh, uh, video here about about eight months ago. Doing some graphics? Yeah. They used my characters in, in one of their videos. That's a funny band. Yeah. They're, they're wild, believe me. And I I have a certain connection with rock and roll and uh, I'm, I, I guess if I have any future success in animation, it would probably be through rock videos. Uh, when I was speaking with Victor Miscoso, he's describing the uh, the jam sessions you you guys would have, and um, I asked him if uh, there were any videotapes of the jams. He said there was uh, one in existence, kind of a home mo home movie. Seventy two, I believe it was. Yeah, and I forgot what he called it. It was. Um, I can't remember. It just seems like it's been one to me. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> seemed like that, that period was pretty well documented. And, you know, the Zap thing was really big when it started in the late 60s. It was well recognized. And it was, see, it was right in the middle of the Vietnam War, and there was a, it, was in, it was part and parcel of the social revolution against the Vietnam War. Hmm. And when the war died out in 75, the, the comics just uh, kind of went to sleep with the with the sideburns and, you know, all of the trappings, mm -hmm. the mod trappings that passed, you know, which was, which was kind of sad. Yeah. Well, so it seems, since you mentioned that it was so documented, I'm surprised that there hasn't been a Zap documentary. Well, I'll tell you, there's been two or three serious attempts at a movie. Did Victor tell you about that? And just briefly, he just touched on it and didn't elaborate so much because of the feasibility of it was uh, probably so low. In 1970, we made a real strong attempt to come up with a movie, and a lot of the big studios were seriously interested in it, but we would not compromise the subject matter. And they couldn't see spending $2 million in two years for a movie that uh, you know, would uh, be questionable when it came out. They were afraid that tempo, the mood of the country would change by the time of something like this was... In, in the 70s, early 70s during the Vietnam War, there was always a chance of a big right-wing resurgence. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And when, when we started doing these underground comics, we were, we were actually uh, like columnists or something. We always feared that there's going to be a, a social upheaval to the right, and we're all going to get run to detention camps or something. And that was a, really a serious thing to worry about back in the 60s. Uh, the, the internment camps for the Japanese were being refurbished during the Vietnam War. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yes, they sure as hell was. And, and what was the intent on that? Well, it was, it was a, if there would have been a swing to the right, they counted up all the odd balls. That would have sure as hell been South artist. Or at least uh, part of the parcel. Now, I was speaking with Spain last night, Spain Rodriguez, and he mentioned to me that there was a gentleman in Florida um, that he couldn't remember his name that has been forbidden to draw because his work was so shocking. Now, I can't imagine what this is. I heard about this. My own memory. Yeah, I just heard about this. Yeah, in fact, that he can't even draw for his own pleasure. And how they prevent him from doing it, I don't know. 
But uh, it sure seemed interesting that, uh, and I confirmed with him that this is a current thing going on. I'd heard this from some other people, too. I just can't bring it to mind right now. Right. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about the show that's coming up? Well, you'd have to see the one in New York in 1989 to realize what this one's going to be, because this one's going to be bigger and better, you know. This, there has never been a thing on the West Coast like this. It was, uh, it kind of ignited New York and took off. And we could have, we could have milked that thing year after year, but that's not quite our style, you know. Mm -hmm. So when, when the thing gets out here, when it, it opens on June the third, you're going to get people coming out of the woodwork that uh, you, know, you, you, you know. How do they fit into this? You know, you're going to get so many strange people. You're going to have people coming in from. We know people coming in from Europe. People who come from New York. People will be coming from all over to see this. Do you think the uh, what do you think the cross the cross, cross section is going to be like? Are we going to be people that uh, are just? It's going to be old hippies. It's going to be young people. It's going to be rockers. It's going to be people who just come to smell the crowd. You're, you're going to have you're going to have the liberal press here, and the problem you're going to have with the liberal press is they're going to, a lot of the zap stuff is not correct anymore. See. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be offensive to a lot of people, and uh, it's going to be interesting to, you know, get to get the reaction on uh, what, what the LA Weekly is going to say about this thing. Yeah, because uh, in fact, you were telling me that uh, there are some ads being run in the LA Weekly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's it's almost because uh, that was almost a banner of of uh, liberal attitudes. Now uh, it would be hard, or it would be uh, contradictory for the liberal press to slam it in any way, or it would seem that way. Well, now that's going to be interesting to see how this is going to be taken. You know, it's, uh, is it going to be viewed as a sexist thing, or uh, you know, is it just? Uh, well, it's not taken out of context historically and artistically, and. Well, uh, there's going to be some criticism of it. Uh, Somewhere. People are going to just not like it and not say anything. That's, uh, that's generally the way it works. I remember the Village Voice, when they covered it in New York, uh, they get real nice write-ups to, to Crum and Will Spain and all. But when they come to me, they found a, a real easy target with a feminist, because I've stirred the feminists up a couple of times. Well, they, they worked that out. They, Through your work? Any pieces in particular? Oh gosh, I don't know. A lot of it. Yeah. A lot of it. You know, I I, was, I did that for, that was used on the Guns Roses album Appetite Destruction. So that keeps coming back up into the country. Oh, that's that's the uh, the kid with the switchblade in? No, that's this this is a picture of a gal in the street on the street with uh, with her dress pulled up around her waist and her panties down around her ankles and a big robot standing over her like he just raped her. Oh, that's right. So I ended up having to answer for that thing a couple of times here. Hmm. So uh, I, I would say uh, that this is actually a, you know, a thing to witness. You know, I would say if you're interested in comic books and you uh, like stuff that's fairly provocative and you, you like that uh, uh, wild imagination. You know? And well done, to say the least. Yeah. This, this would be the place to come and, come and smack around. That's right. And again, that's June 3rd at Lettuce, the day hooses. Light of Jesus. Light of Jesus. The above so planted, the kind of Martel and uh, Melrose. Oh, the couldn't picture where it was, but I've been to the soap plant. They, they sell art books and things like that there. Right. You know, that place is run by a fellow named Alice Shire, and all, all of Melrose, as a fad, as a place to go, it's all started by Shire 15 years ago. Hmm. So he started the entire social movement there on Melrose. Hmm. So I suggest getting there early yeah, on Friday night. Uh, June 3rd uh, starts officially uh, uh, later. And uh, I can imagine it's going to be fairly insane. I think so too. Yeah. I think so too. Unfortunately, I have to do a show that night at midnight, so I have to go back to Dutch County. But I will definitely be there. And uh, hopefully, I can uh, very soon come up and introduce myself and thank you. Thank you, Emperor, for uh, taking this. Come on my show. I appreciate you calling me and uh, wanting to chat with me. Yes, it was great. Again, it's been uh, Robert Williams, Zap Comic Artist, uh, interview on Arbitrary Habitats. It's Fred. Thank you for joining me.